Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the USDA is predicting a 27% drop in net farm income as big crops bring on lower prices. In Southern Gardening, we'll enter the garden zone as we find some unusual plants it's wintering for your landscape. Outside, and today we're at Pine In the markets, traders keep an eye on cash cattle for any signs of weakness as the cotton sector looks to exports to provide further price support. In the feature segment, this year marked the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions' 45th year. The 2014 sale set a new record for overall winning bids, more than $300,000. It takes a lot of responsibility to take care of it. You have to be able to wash them, feed them, and water them every day. You have to be able to walk them, take care of them. You can't procrastinate with it. You can't be unresponsible with them. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says farm income will drop in 2014. Artis, last year net farm income peaked at its highest point in 30 years. Now the USDA says it will drop substantially, even though a record corn crop and a large soybean crop are predicted for this year. The farm economy is still strong financially, but big crops often lead to oversupplies and lower prices. Net farm income is forecast to fall nearly 27 percent this year to $95.8 billion. That would still be above the 10-year average. The 2013 income level was $130.5 billion, the highest since 1973 when adjusted for inflation. If realized, this would be the smallest income level since 2010. The decline is attributed primarily to sharply lower crop cash receipts for both corn and soybeans. At 13.9 billion bushels, the 2013 corn crop was the largest in history, which contributed to lower prices. USDA is calling for $11 billion less in corn receipts this year and $6 billion less in soybean sales. All right, I'm about to start signing. Another factor in the government's estimates is the elimination of direct payments under the recently enacted Farm Bill of 2014. Also at issue is the uncertainty regarding enrollment and payments in other programs this year, which could reduce government disbursements by 45 percent. Traditionally, input costs have paralleled growth in market price for grain. However, this year, total production expenses are forecast to decline $3.9 billion in 2014. If realized, that would only be the second time in a decade that has occurred. The growth rate in farm assets, debt and equity also is projected to slow in 2014 compared to recent years. Lower net income, higher borrowing costs and moderation in the growth of farmland values are all contributing factors to the prognosis. The value of farm assets and farm sector debt both are expected to rise just over 2% in 2014. That's counter to the last few years. However, USDA says the historically low levels of debt to asset levels and equity affirm the agricultural sector's strong financial position. Another bright spot in the disappointing outlook could be found in the livestock sector, where receipts are expected to rise seven tenths of a point, largely due to a 7% increase in dairy earnings. While net farm income will drop this year, when you adjust for inflation, it will still be the seventh highest year since 1973. The world of horticulture can offer some unique and unusual plants. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Rod Serling shows us two botanical oddities. You unlock this door with the key of curiosity and you enter another dimension. 
A dimension of sights, a dimension of smells, a dimension of textures. You move into a dimension of both nature and permutations. You've just crossed over into the garden zone. It's winter and cold outside, and today we're at Pine Hills Nursery, checking out a couple of very unusual plants. Our first botanical oddity is the citron plant. You may know citron as one of those candied fruits used in the holiday fruitcakes that you always throw away. But have you ever dared to discover what the real citron fruit actually looks like? At first glance, the fruit looks kind of like a lemon gone wild. No wonder it's called by the common name of Buddha hand. The fruit is multi-fingered and has a remarkable appearance and are actually bigger than most people's hands. Another plant that comes from a dimension beyond that which is known to man is Mother of Thousands. There are several varieties that use the same common name. The leaves are actually thickened structures called phyloclades, and these plants have a unique form of propagation. During the short days of winter, baby plantlets, and I mean lots of baby plantlets, develop along the edges. The baby plantlets actually develop roots, so they are ready to start growing wherever they fall off. Some years the plants even produce stalks with an umbrella-like inflorescence with bell-shaped pink flowers. So the next time you're feeling daring and courageous, travel to a dimension as timeless as infinity. Daring to delve into this dimension might even make your thumbs turn green. It's an area that we call the Garden Zone. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says the horticulture world is full of interesting oddities if you dare to delve into the Garden Zone. In the feature segment today, the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. The 2014 sale was held two weeks ago and it set a record for total winning bids. Time now for the markets with Layton and the nation's largest fresh egg producer is growing some more, you say. That is correct. We'll be telling you what's ahead for Mississippi's own Cal Maine Foods. Also coming up this week in the markets, Pond Bank catfish prices remain up while processing is down. April cattle futures may retest their recent highs while old crop cotton tumbles at midweek. The latest snapshot of the U.S. farm-raised catfish industry came out since our last program. In January, producers in the United States received a pond bank price of $1.10 per pound for premium size live fish. Now that is 29 cents per pound more than was paid one year ago. Farm sales totaled just under 27 million pounds round weight a drop of 9% from January 2013. Meanwhile, processor sales were heading the other direction last month. They were up 11 and one half percent from a year ago and totaled just under 13 million pounds. From aquaculture to beef now, as we record at midday on Thursday, the cattle trade is anticipating the Friday, February 21st monthly cattle on feed report. In the meantime, beef demand hangs in for the most part according to analyst Tom Fitzenmeyer and other traders. The cash market, everybody's expecting some weakness this week and there really wasn't any. And I think that popped us up and, and probably will continue to. I, I think there's a chance that April cattle could retest the highs. I don't, I don't, I'm not in the camp that thinks we're gonna make new highs, but we certainly could retest them. The cattle market is strong enough and, and unless there's some catastrophic thing comes along, I think you're going to be fairly well supported. So I don't, I don't know that there's a reason to get really aggressively selling the market, but certainly having a put uh, under the market wouldn't be a, a bad idea because uh, when things get really good, they can change and not be good for a while. Mississippi's Calmaine Foods, the largest producer of fresh shell eggs in the U.S., grows a little bigger as of March 1st. On that date, Cal Maine will acquire 50% of the membership interest of Delta Egg Farm, a company that Cal Maine already owns 50% of. Delta Egg will become a Cal Maine subsidiary. Delta Egg has operations in Utah and Kansas. Cal Maine sells its shell eggs in approximately 29 states. Our trivia quiz this week concerns row crop production in the state last year. Here's the question for you. What Mississippi crop showed the largest decrease in value of production in 2013? Is the answer grain sorghum or sweet potatoes or cotton or peanuts? I'll tell you at the end of the markets. 
We're going to pause for a short break on farm wheat. Coming up, a look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span reports the wheat market is wondering about winter kill, while the U.S. cotton market needs exports. In the feature segment today, the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. The sale set a new record for total winning bids this year. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm wheat calendar. Landowners interested in improving their quail and turkey habitat should attend the Mississippi State University Game Bird Workshop. The Game Bird Workshop will be held Friday, March 20, excuse me, February 28th at Percy Quinn State Park. That's at Macomb. There is a $30 registration fee and you should pre-register to assure yourself a seat. You'll learn about how to establish quail and turkey habitat. You'll also learn about the pros and cons of using pen raised quail on a property. We will have an online registration link on our Farm Week website calendar. A prescribed burning workshop will be held the following day at Percy Quinn. That's Saturday, March 1st. You'll learn about how to conduct prescribed burns and how to do it legally. The cost of the workshop is $10. You should pre-register as well to assure yourself a seat. We will have that online registration link on our Farm Week website calendar. Go to our Farm Week website calendar at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We move into row crops now and begin with wheat. Following the tough weather so far here in 2014, there are questions about possible damage to wheat from winter kill, especially in regions north of the Mid-South. Trader Don Rose says only time will tell and that there is still a lot of world competition as far as wheat. Well, we're really not going to know until we come out of dormancy how serious it was, but we have on the backdrop, remember we did have the uh, planted acres were down about a million from what we had anticipated earlier. So I think really where we're at is uh, we're still in a supply bear market. Uh, the United States uh, stocks are, uh, are tight, you know, very similar to the uh, uh, soybeans, U.S. Tight, stocks are tight, but not the world's uh, stocks. So I think all we did is we just really moved up to some levels of resistance. We're probably going to need new catalysts to move higher. The cotton market is our next stop. Exports of U.S. fiber have been good, but more are needed to keep some fundamental support under cotton prices. Extension Ag economist John Michael Riley told me in this interview that exports are indeed the driver of the cotton trade. Well, what did the monthly supply demand report from Washington tell us about cotton? Domestically, not a lot of changes. In fact, we're sitting right on par with where we were at uh, the month prior. Uh, where the changes came was in global uh, ending stocks. Those were reduced marginally, uh, largely due to a reduction of one million bales uh, from, from China. Mm -hmm. So that reduced their, their total ending stocks and that carried on, over, on through to, to global ending stock reduction, but still were very high in terms of, of, of global ending stocks. And China still count, accounts for roughly 60% of those stocks. So they're still holding quite a few, few uh, cotton bales in, in their inventories and that's really continues to be uh, a plaguing the market, you know, a, lot, a big cloud over the market in, in regard to, to what China uh, will do with those. Were traders really expecting those kind of numbers from in this latest report, or was that a little bit of a surprise? Mostly expected market was had a mild reaction, mild reaction positive because it was a reduction in, ending, in global ending stocks, but mild nonetheless, so it was largely expected. Now you mentioned China's stockpile that, that the government there uh, controls. Uh, that situation still is not likely to change anytime soon. Not likely to change and continues just to be a, a tremendous amount of uncertainty given the, the history there. So uh, we, we fully expect them to, to, to not do anything drastic, but again, they, they hold a lot of bales of cotton and that, that is going to be a cloud over the market moving forward. Now the Cotton Council's annual planning intention survey, which came out a little before this uh, latest supply demand report, it, 
it was calling for a little more planted acreage coming up this year as opposed to what the, the latest supply demand report said, right? That's correct. USDA put out their projections and pegged it at 11 million acres. Cotton Council had theirs at uh, just under 11.3 uh, 11 million. Everything's really been in that 11 million ballpark. Uh, we've seen corn prices and soybean prices decline since since uh, this past summer, since the last growing season. And cotton prices, while they've been on, uh, been up and down, they've they've maintained for the most part their their that range of in, in the mid 80s. So, uh, if anything, they might have gained some acres from what pr producers were expecting, and that's probably where Cotton Council came in at slightly above that USDA projection. And as far as prices, we kind of expect things to go on like they are. To this point, exports have been really strong, which has been supportive of prices. We've seen the dollar weaken, and that's been supportive of exports. So that right now continues to be the driver of where prices are, have been and are headed. Before our new feature story, let's check the trivia answer for this week. And the correct choice is D, the value of peanut production in Mississippi decreased 58% last year. And our feature story today, Farm Week's Amy Taylor has highlights from Mississippi's premier livestock show and sale. That's right, Artis. It was another record-breaking year for the 2014 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions held in Jackson, Mississippi. Only at this event can 4-H and FFA livestock exhibitors claim such high dollar amounts for animals they've raised and shown all year long. To finish out the season, exhibitors compete at the Dixie National Junior Roundup hoping for champion titles. The sale showcased 44 champion and reserve champion animals out of more than 2,000 shown at Roundup. Additionally, scholarships were awarded to exhibitors who showed excellence in their livestock projects and academics. The Dixie National Junior Roundup is probably the most exciting event of the year for 4-H and FFA livestock exhibitors. It's also the most intense because only the best of the best claim a spot in the prestigious Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. At the sale, animals who won a champion title at Roundup are sold for top dollar. This year, two records were broken. The grand champion lamb sold for $12,000, and the grand champion steer went for a whopping $28,000. The Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions has come a long way since it began 45 years ago. The first sale brought a total of about $7,600. Since then, sale totals are projected to reach over $300,000. Nowhere else can exhibitors expect to reach such a high return on investment in their animals, so you can see why the competition to get here is so fierce. To help explain how hard it is to make the sale, here's how the competition process works. Before Roundup, animals are categorized based on their breed, then placed in groups identified as either lightweight, medium weight, or heavyweight. Next, the judge chooses a first and second place animal from each weight group of that breed. Then the first place animals from light, medium, and heavyweight compete for champion of their breed. When the champion of its breed is chosen, the animal that placed second in that same weight group moves up for a chance at being chosen reserve champion. After champions and reserves are chosen for each breed, an overall grand champion is selected. So each champion from its breed must come back out for the grand champion drive. When the grand champion is named, the reserve from that same breed goes up for a chance to win reserve grand overall. The same process goes for cattle, hogs, and goats, and the different species don't compete against each other. As you can see, there could be 20 to 30 animals just in one weight group. And with several breeds in the competition, each divided into three weight groups, an animal must be top-notch to stand out. Taylor McNair of Learned Mississippi says she was fortunate to make it to the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. This year I did make it to the Sale of Champions. I had two animals to make it. I had a market steer who was a champion English and I also had a market lamb who was reserve shrop. That was super exciting for me to have not only one but two animals my very last year. Sunday was a really chaotic day. We had both the lamb show and the market steer show and those were both the animals that I was able to get into the sale of champions. So it was a very chaotic day running back and forth. They actually had to hold a show for me. Additionally, McNair says winning reserve champion with the Shropshire breed was exciting and and shocking. It was very exciting. I was actually second in my class. I was a lightweight 
and when we came back in, normally that spot is not going to get a title, but he went to the lightweight, the first place lightweight, and then he came to me afterwards, and that was super shocking because that hardly ever happens. McNair says lightweight champions are very rare because market animals are judged based on the amount and quality of meat they'll produce. Therefore, animals are judged by muscle mass, fat content, length of body, and structural soundness. After Roundup champions were named and the 2014 Dixie National Sale concluded, the grand total for all 44 animals rang up at $369,000 surpassing last year's total by 50,000. But selling champions isn't the only goal. 29 academic scholarships worth $1,500 each and six premier exhibitor scholarships worth $2,000 were awarded to deserving exhibitors like Lane Spell of Holmes County. I won the uh, Swine Premier Exhibitor and I've been studying for about a month for it. I've been working with my pigs for about three months for it. It's all, you get scored on the test that you take and then you get scored on your pigs that you show during the show time. Additionally, Spell explains what the test involves. It was food, naming food samples, it was naming parts of a pig, structure of a pig, it was an interview, and it was a 25 question test. I think showing the animal was a little more difficult because you had to work with it harder and longer. The test, it was just memory stuff. Furthermore, Spell says he's learned a lot about responsibility and preparation. Uh, it takes a lot of responsibility to take care of it. You have to be able to wash them, feed them, and water them every day. You have to be able to walk them, take care of them. You can't procrastinate with it. You can't be unresponsible with them. About two years ago, we had a bad experience where it was 70 degrees outside, which is way too hot for a show pig. And it was all the pigs were stressing out left and right on us. And then this year was really cold, which the pigs really liked when it was really cold. But I also had a pig that got sick. So you got to be able to keep them warm when it's cold, keep them cool when it's hot. Spell hopes to put his scholarship toward enrollment at Mississippi State University. Academic scholarship winner Sarah Terrell of Brookhaven says her goal is to become an agriculture instructor, 4-H agent, or FFA advisor. She explains what she's discovered is fun and interesting about working with hogs. You'd be surprised. They really do have different personalities. I have a gilt, which is a girl pig, and a barrow, which is a boy. And um, my guilt, she can be moody at times, but then again, she's sweet and fun, I guess, just like women. And um, the bear, he's really sweet and fun. You can scrub their belly and they'll lay over like a dog, uh, but they do have multiple personalities. They're kind of like dogs, um, but yeah, they definitely do have personalities. In addition, Terrell talks about what you'll see at the barn on show day. Regardless of the species of animal, anything can be expected from lambs misbehaving to running completely loose in the middle of the championship drive. People are going to be running everywhere, uh, especially like in a pig barn. If a pig gets out of their cage, they're going to be running down the aisle. Uh, some are a little bit more tame than others uh, if they've been worked with at home. But you will see people running. You will pe see people hollering probably, trying to get their pigs to stop or their cow to stop. Um, Yes, and you will see brushes flying everywhere, shoshin going every which way, but all in the end, it's, it's fun. At this point, you're probably wondering where the funds come from to make the sale and scholarships possible. Sale of Champions Committee Chairman Jerry Host says the committee works hard to solicit buyers from around the state. I don't know a lot about animals. My background, I do know which end the food goes in. But uh, my involvement is more from the standpoint of raising money. There are a variety of companies throughout the state that will come together either as a buying group, some individually, that will uh, bid on a particular animal uh, because of an interest in uh, a client or a group of people within a county uh, that they have an interest in. So uh, there may be as many as 10 people in a single buying group or it may be as low as an individual. Furthermore, host claims you don't have to know much about agriculture or livestock to appreciate the value these projects bring to Mississippi. Not only is livestock important to the state's economy, but it helps shape the 4-H and FFA exhibitors who often become our future leaders. From Jackson, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. You can watch this story again on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. We'll have links and telephone numbers there for you to find out more about junior livestock shows in Mississippi. You can also contact your county extension service office to join Mississippi 4-H. 
Participation through Mississippi FFA is available at many public schools. Our website is farmweek.msucares.com. Now you said you showed for how many years? 11 years. 11 years? Sheep and oh, hogs. Boy. That's a lot of poo to shovel. <laughs> it is. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of interesting stories. But uh, you said uh, you showed sheep, sheep and, and hogs. Sheep and hogs at the same time. That's right. It's a good program. Thanks, Amy. Great story. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we'll have two feature stories for you. Harrison Logging of Grenada, Mississippi has racked up 30 years of work without a lost time accident. GMOs continues to cause controversy. We'll take the pulse of the GMO argument. Do we need them or is there no way we can do without them? In Southern Gardening, see who is on the guest list for your garden party. If you'd like further information on a Farm Week story or want to suggest a story to us, get in touch. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Our mailing address, Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. That's Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. Our telephone number is 662-325-2262. You can also contact us through your county office of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.